Yeah, this person was a little offended when I said masseuse, and they said, no, massage therapist. And so I put my pants back on. <laughs> Welcome to Damn It, Jim, the podcast. My name is Dana Smith, and as always, I'm joined by Dan Calzaretta. Dan, how are you this evening? Doing great, Dana. I am. Uh, last week, I talked about a beer I was drinking, so I'll talk about one that I'm drinking tonight as well. This is a home brewed Italian Pilsner that I'm drinking this evening. So that is good. And we're going to talk about Star Trek. I, you know, it's going to be a great night. I'm uh, having a little scotch before the show began. We did a toast to a uh, departed friend. It's a nice evening here in Colorado, and I'm looking forward to doing this episode. Sure, leave. Yeah, as am I. I love this episode. But before we get into that, I want to talk about some messages we've received. We have a new listener, Tracy, who said that she thinks that we're very funny. <laughs> Can I, also, can I say something about that, that Dana? <laughs> no, she says we're funny. She's never seen us, has she? No. Okay. The, I mean, there is a picture of us on Facebook. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So she might mean funny looking. I don't know. Well, I took it the best way possible. But, okay, good. <laughs> and then we also heard from uh, Joe, who said that him and his wife sit down every week and do a date night that starts off by listening to our podcast. <laughs> now, this is a hearty couple if they're able to listen to us and still stay together i don't want to say anything like to offend them uh because i don't want to lose any listeners so no, <laughs> no. S seriously though thanks yeah it's great to hear from listeners it, you know the first few weeks we did this we maybe hear from some friends who told us to stop or family members who <laughs> advise that we get counseling but it's great to no, now start to hear from people we don't know yeah we've had uh listeners come in from australia and from austria and there is a difference between those two so yes uh, there is <laughs> one has kangaroos and and other things. And the other one has goats and mountains. And really good beer. Really, really yeah, good beer. Really good beer. Thanks again for everybody that's been tuning in and for your continued comments. Yeah, I find the comments actually very helpful. So keep those coming. So this week, it's episode 15, Shore Leave. The uh, show starts off with Captain Kirk in the captain's chair, and he's uh, Spock is next to him, and there's a young female yeoman next to him, and he's talking about his back hurting. He's got a kink in his back, and uh, the yeoman steps behind him and starts rubbing his back and he's like yeah right there and he thinks it's Spock Spock walks in front of him and he realizes the yeoman and he's like oh oh that's good and she comments that he's very tense and needs uh, some rest and relaxation and he says you're sounding just like Dr. McCoy so she's rubbing his back he thinks it's Spock which indicates to me that Spock has rubbed his back before but Spock can do that nerve pinch do you think he would be maybe a pretty good uh, massage therapist I would think he'd have to be I think so, too. I think that's one of the things they train you in on Vulcan before they teach you the nerve pinch. I think they teach you how to massage somebody. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So you start off as a masseuse, work your way up to the nerve pinch. Now, I, I was told by someone who's a massage therapist that masseuse is not the right term for a massage therapist. One mm -hmm. provides a medical healing type of service, and the other you would find potentially on Wrigley's Pleasure Planet. I, I did not know that. Wow, already. Already. Oh, so, Dana, hold on a second. Already? I think I need to take out the ramble jar. So we talked about the ramble jar last week. Do you know how much money I put in the ramble jar last week? I don't know, 50 bucks. You, as usual, went off the rails. Yeah, I know, I did. So, no, it wasn't 50, but there's $13. Maybe that's all I had in my wallet, but there's $13 in the ramble jar this week. I think we probably should keep track just for fun. We don't need to be super hardcore about it, but I think we should keep track so that you can get that plane ticket to Seattle next year for the uh, for the Star Trek convention. Okay, back on track. <laughs> Okay, here uh, we go. The Enterprise is circling a planet. The planet does look kind of familiar. The producers took the planet that was shown in Miri, which looked exactly like Earth, and you could see the outline of North America, and they used that same planet, but apparently they didn't want people to see the same exact thing, so they reversed it so North America would not be as obvious, and then they made it really green. We see that Sulu and McCoy are walking around on the planet. Sulu says there's no people, no animals, no worries just what the doctor ordered. McCoy says, I couldn't have prescribed it better. Says, we are one weary ship and says it's something like out of Alice in Wonderland. Sulu goes off to check on some plants and McCoy keeps walking. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, this big white rabbit comes hopping around a little bit, pulls out his watch and makes some kind of comment about the time. And then he runs off into the woods. McCoy is just standing there kind of dumbstruck. A little girl comes running up. She's like, did you see a little white rabbit pop? 
pass by. That was pretty good, by the way. Yeah, I worked on that. McCoy kind of points in the direction the rabbit went. She runs off, says thank you, and runs off. McCoy is just kind of dumbfounded, and that's where the show starts. Back on the ship, the captain's log reads, We are orbiting a non-inhabited planet in the Omicron Delta region, a planet remarkably like Earth, or how we remember Earth to be. Park-like, beautiful, green, flowers, trees, green lawn, quiet and restful almost too good to be true so we see uh kirk is with the yeoman in his quarters of and, course he is uh, and she says uh, i don't see your name on any of the shore party groups and he says he may be tired but he doesn't need to go down to the planet then spock enters the look again <laughs> because the yeoman's leaving as he's entering right yeah you know a woman's in kirk's room the writing's on the wall the writing might be on the wall but apparently there's no sign outside on the wall that says <laughs> do not enter because he walks right in <laughs> or not or ring the doorbell. Nothing. Yeah. And once again, maybe in the 23rd century, they're more open about that kind of thing. I, I don't really know. But I mean, what if they were involved in some discussions of, I don't know, import that Spock should not have been privy to? Kirk asks Spock what group he's going to beam down with. And Spock says that he's it's not necessary. On my planet, to rest is to rest, to cease using energy. To me, it is quite illogical to run up and down on green grass using energy instead of saving it. That's an interesting concept. I tried using that as a kid with my dad. I need to rest, and to rest is to rest. I'm not going to run around outside mowing the lawn. He never bought that. Yeah, I, I only met your dad a few times, but I can imagine <laughs> he would not have bought that. No one's dad would have bought that. Let's face it, that's, yeah. that would not be. Especially when I said that's illogical. And then he says, I'll <laughs> give you something logical. <laughs> Spock says there's something else he wants to talk to Kirk about. One of the crewmen is experiencing fatigue, delayed reaction times, becoming irritable and quarrelsome. Yet he refuses to take rest and rehabilitation. Now he has that right. Crewman's right ends where the safety of the ship begins. Now that man will go ashore on my orders. What's his name? James Kirk. He gets he gets a little grin on his face, uh, <laughs> yeah, like he's caught him in, his, in a trap. And then he says, enjoy yourself, Captain. We go back to the planet and there's a rock that's lifting up and under it, we see a revolver. Now we're getting clues that this is not an ordinary planet. So there are other crewmen down the planet. There's Rodriguez and Martine. Okay, so and, Dana, hold on a second, hold on. <laughs> so this Angela Martine was from the last episode. She was going to get married to Robert Tomlinson. He buys it in the phaser room, the pink fog accent in the phaser room. Wow, she didn't waste any time getting back on that horse because she was like... She I, was after Rodriguez. She was totally after that guy. She's she's ready to go. Yeah, because look, Dana, 23rd century, you're not going to like lament for more than about, I don't know, a couple days about somebody you were just about to marry, you know, then just get back to it. So Kirk and the yeoman uh, beam down to the planet. They find McCoy and he points out the rabbit marks on the ground. Now, when I say rabbit marks, I mean paw prints or whatever. I don't mean like droppings. You know, that's <laughs> a great point, though. That rabbit would have left huge droppings, Dana. Huge. Yeah, like softball size. At least. No problem tracking those. Once he sees the uh, rabbit paw prints on the ground, he cancels surely until they can prove that the planet is safe. And just when he says that, they hear a gunshot. Uh, they take off running towards the sound of the gunfire and they find Sulu and uh, he's holding this 38 police special. I haven't got anything like this in my collection. Where did you get it, Mr. Sulu? I found it. I know it's a crazy coincidence, but I've always wanted one like this. Hasn't been one like this made in, oh, a couple centuries. Why would you be walking around on a deserted planet and be thinking about a 38 special revolver that's not in your collection. That, yeah, that, that really didn't make too much sense. But but he, he kind of does explain a little bit that it's one he's always wanted, right? So you're walking around this planet again and going, you know, I've got everything I want here except the 38 special police revolver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. That is kind of dumb. Well, if you were walking around that planet, Dana, what would you be thinking about? You know, I mean, what would you have wanted if you were walking around that planet? Planet. So moving on. Uh... <laughs> I mean, let's say you were walking with Yeoman Barrow, for example. But let's just do a thought experiment. <laughs> And, and this is where my marriage goes south. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is just a totally just a thought experiment. It's just, again, you and me. You know, what What would you be thinking about? Relaxation. Uh, the ability to uh, not have any worries for 24 hours or so. You know, maybe go swimming in the pond. And yeah, that's, that's a bunch of crap, Dana. 
That is a bunch <laughs> of crap. I know you too well. That's a bunch of crap because I know what I'd be thinking about. And I think you'd be thinking about the same thing. <laughs> Where are we going to get a beer? That's what we'd be thinking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Barrow sees that there's more rabbit prints on the ground. So Barrows and Sulu go off in one direction and Kirk and McCoy go off in another as Kirk and McCoy go away, we see this antenna pop up, kind of like moving in the direction that Kirk and McCoy are going. And they don't see it, obviously. It just seems like a small antenna. So anyway, Kirk starts talking about this upperclassman who at the academy tormented him. And his name was Finnegan. He talks about how Finnegan played practical jokes on him, just always at odds with him. And McCoy makes the comment, well, you were very serious. And he says, oh, I was terribly serious to the point of being grim. So he says that would just cause Finnegan to torment Kirk all the more. Which so seems I, so unkirk like to me. Even as an underclassman, I can't see him being really grim. And if you go to the Star Trek movies, the J.J. Abrams, by the way, Dana, we've heard from a lot of people, but he has not, listen, I don't want to say this too much, too many times, really, but J.J., it's about time you contacted us. We need to hear from you. But in the J.J. Abrams reboot, he's not serious at all. Yeah, it seems like he's barely going to make it through the Academy. Yeah, that's exactly right. They see the rabbit's footprints going in one direction and another set of footprints going the other way. And they determine that the other footprints must be the little girl. And so they head off in different directions. He walks like 20 yards and then someone calls out his name and it's Finnegan. You never know when I'm going to strike. Come on, come on, it's me, Finnegan. <laughs> All right, Jimmy boy. <laughs> He's laughing and he's taunting Kirk, walks up and he hits Kirk with a right cross. Kirk goes and tries to tackle him and they're starting to, to fight. And then all of a sudden they hear a woman scream and it's Yeoman Barrows. So Kirk turns away from Finnegan and runs away. By the way, the laughter was second only to the laugh of Clint Howard's character in the Corbin Might Maneuver. I mean, it was it was demonic almost. They find Yeoman Barrows and her dress is torn and she's crying. And she says a man with a cloak and a dagger with jewels on it attacked her. She confesses that she had just been thinking about an old storybook romantic adventure like Don Juan. Yeah, see... Did you read Don Juan? No, no, but I looked it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of knew the idea. I, I knew the yeah. general idea. Did you read I it? I saw the... No, I saw the old Errol Flynn movie. What is it with this Don Juan thing? What What's the story behind Don Juan? Don Juan was like a guy who went around romancing women, made women feel beautiful and loved, and he had his way with a lot of women. Did he tear their shirts often? Because her shirt was ripped. Uh, once again, sexism in Star Trek. She's obviously been attacked and she says all a girl needs is don juan just daydreaming the way you would about someone you'd like to meet here's this trained starfleet yeoman and she's thinking of being seduced by a don juan i mean does that make any sense to you it's like sulu thinking you know gee i wish i had a 38 special police revolver out here it just moves the story forward in a different direction and puts somebody in peril so she says that uh sulu ran after the man that attacked her and kirk goes to look for sulu kirk tries calling mccoy but there's no response then mccoy manages to get through to him and asks if he found sulu and then uh Rodriguez calls and says he saw a flock of birds and he says the sensors here said that there were no life signs here. Kirk tells Rodriguez to meet back at the landing area and discuss these things. Spock calls down and says they're getting strange readings from the planet. Says some sort of power field, highly sophisticated, draining their power and affecting communications. Did you get the sense that it was draining their power enough that the ship's eventually going to spiral into the planet because it doesn't have enough power? Yeah, I didn't get that sense of urgency from Spock. Yeah, it didn't seem like he had that sense of urgency, but that's kind of how I took it. Although yeah. Scotty's not in this episode, right? So there's no Scotty and you would to need him keep the ship from spiraling down to the planet. You would need Scotty. Yeah, why wasn't he in this episode? Would have been a perfect place for him. Oh, I think he would have had some great fantasies there. So <laughs> they'd probably have a hard time getting him off the planet. McCoy and Barrels are walking and she's holding onto McCoy's arm. And then we see that antenna again. And she's saying that a girl on this planet should be dressed like a 
fairy tale princess. And McCoy says, you'd have whole armies of Don Juans to fight off, and me too. So we start to see McCoy is uh, showing some interest in Barrows. McCoy turns towards her, and she says, is that a promise, Doctor? McCoy takes her hands and moves towards her, and it looks like they're going to kiss. They kind of stare at one another, and then she sees this type of fairy tale clothes that are hanging from a branch. McCoy says he'd like to see her in it. So she agrees to put it on. She says, don't peek. McCoy says, My dear girl, I am a doctor. When I peek, it's in the line of duty. Which was one of my favorite lines. Yeah, I, I agree. I love that line. Even though this whole, again, the whole sexism thing in this part of the episode is just thick. So while he's waiting for her to change, he gets a call from Rodriguez. Communication is bad, but Rodriguez tells McCoy to meet at the place where the captain first found him. Then the signal goes out. Next, we see a tiger and we see Rodriguez and Martine are pressed tight together trying to hide from the tiger. Rodriguez keeps trying to raise McCoy on the communication communicator as a tiger appears to approach and then the tiger just kind of turns away but did you notice when he was trying to get mccoy and the the communications were bad they were static and rodriguez is kind of shaking the communicator is almost to say that maybe there's just something loose in here if i just shake it a little bit then he's going to hear me better i thought that was really funny when i saw that i mean here's this tiger about to eat the two of them and he's like shaking the communicator i think i'd be throwing the communicator at the tiger and or maybe throwing martine at the tiger she she was just going to marry this Robert Tomlinson last week. You know, she's hooking up with Esteban. There's no way he can count on her. Just toss her to the tiger. Well, they did say it's been a tough three months. So maybe the Romulan thing was at the beginning of those three months. So it's been three months and she's, you know, paid her dues and she's just, girl's got to have what a girl's got to have. We go back to McCoy and Barrows and she comes out in her fairy tale maiden's outfit and uh, McCoy gets a big grin on his face. He got a big and something. The point of the podcast. I guess is not to see how much you can make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> We kind of bounce around between McCoy and Rodriguez, and then we're back to Kirk. He's talking to Spock on the ship. He's telling him about all the strange things they've encountered. Spock suggests sending down an armed security team, but Kirk says negative. The crew has phasers. Just then, we go back to Sulu, and he's walking along this kind of rocky desert area, and all of a sudden, a samurai appears from under a rock. The samurai has his sword and is swinging at Sulu, and Sulu pulls out his phaser and tries to fire but nothing happens. I think the scene was really well done. The, the fight choreography was excellent. Do you remember in the old uh, Saturday Night Lives when Belushi would do the samurai whatever, samurai chef? Yeah, samurai, samurai Taylor. <laughs> 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 yeah, those are great. I love those. Sulu managed to escape, and he runs over the rocks to where Kirk is. Sulu's uh, kind of panicked and says, run, there's a samurai after me. We look around, we don't see the samurai, and Sulu says, you, you gotta believe me, and Kirk says he does. Sulu explains that his phaser isn't working, and Kirk tries to fire his phaser, and nothing happens. Then we see someone is beaming down, and Sulu makes the comment, someone's beaming down from the bridge. So after a few moments, uh, Spock materializes, and he explains the transport is barely working and communication is non-existent. He explains the power field is soaking up all the power from all their devices. So that's why the communicators are not working well and the phasers don't work, right? Correct. So then we see uh, McCoy and Barrow walking. Now they're walking hand in hand and McCoy says he thought he heard someone moving around and he walks out in front of her and she says she's scared and McCoy responds, a princess should not be afraid, not with a brave knight to protect her. And we go back to Kirk and Sulu and Spock and they hear something like a tiger growl and they go running towards it <laughs> I know this part Dana I uh, I was like whoa and, and he said split up okay so the tiger gets to eat all of them individually I mean it just was kind of a dumb move I think Kirk's thinking well you know if it eats Sulu and then it eats Spock then I'm still alive it'll be too full to eat me I think that maybe what he's thinking because they they know at this point the phasers don't work right yeah so then we go back to McCoy and Barrows they see a knight in armor with a jousting lance. McCoy says these things cannot be real. Hallucinations 
assassinations cannot harm us. The knight charges forward with his lance forward. Spock and Kirk are walking closer and see McCoy right when the knight kills McCoy. Uh, this part I thought was great. They do a close-up of the knight on the horse and he pulls the lance out of McCoy. Oh, it's really stuck in there. I got to really pull on this to get it out. <laughs> yeah, and you know, of course, Barrows is screaming and Spock tries his phaser, but nothing happens. Kirk, I don't think we mentioned this before, but Kirk took away the revolver from Sulu, so he's got the revolver and the knight turns towards them and Kirk fires and knocks the knight from the horse. They run to see McCoy and uh, they reach McCoy and it's obvious he's dead. And yeah, he's got this huge red hole in his chest. So Yeoman Barrows starts blaming herself and she's crying and Kirk tries to calm her down and then Sulu calls to Kirk and uh, Sulu is over by the fallen knight and we see inside the helmet looks kind of like a dummy. Sulu says it couldn't be alive. Spock's tricorder is still working and he reports that the dummy has the same basic cell structure as the plants and the trees. Okay, so a couple things with this that I, that I want to say, Dana. When they first show the face of the knight, it's actually moving. Did you notice that? Like the, the mouth is moving slightly and it looks like it still has some functionality to it. It was a person. Oh, you think it was a person? It was a person. Later they push on the face and it like, do you think that was yeah. just makeup or plastic they had on there? It pushes in a little bit, but I mean, you know, you do that with your own face and it does that. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> We're both doing this like into the cameras now. We're like, yeah, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> if someone saw this and be like, what the hell? But uh, this is a Star Trek podcast. I thought you're popping pimples or something. But um, apparently one of the most popular YouTube channels is Dr. Pimple Popper. Have you heard of this person? Discovery or something like that. That's yeah. disgusting, man. That's just gross. There are a lot of things I would watch. It? No, I would not watch that, Dana. There are a lot of things I, I would watch. I'm not watching that. I was flipping channels one night and I came across this thing. She's an attractive woman. I thought, okay, I'll watch this for a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, she's got this person in her office or whatever who's got like this cyst or whatever. And uh, she goes over and starts pressing on it. You can see this thing's going to like burst like a volcano. But anyway, going back to the, the this thing, I did not know it was... I, I'm going to go back and watch that again because it, it looked very think, human to me. I think you're right. Maybe it was a person in there that had some makeup on. I think in the credits uh, that I was looking at, it lists the night. Okay, yeah, all right. Person. Well, I just thought that was really well done. And I, I love this next line from Spock. He says, it's a mechanical contrivance. Everything, the plants, the animals, everything is being manufactured. Then they hear a noise and they- Hold on, hold on. Seal. I got to ask you one more thing, Dana. Sorry. I got to ask you one more thing. Why is his tricorder working? Because he just beamed down. But the tricorder, Sulu gave him the tricorder. It wasn't even Spock's oh, right. tricorder. Oh, that's right. He did. Why this one thing? The phases aren't working. The communicators aren't working. Oh no, the tricorder seems to be no problem. They hear a noise and look up and they see a plane flying overhead. We go back to Martin and Rodriguez and they look up and see that it's a plane. And I know a little bit about World War II planes. And the first one they show is a uh, World War II Navy Hellcat. And he explains that this is a plane from long ago and I was telling you about. And he goes, and they attack, they do a strafing run. And just then the plane starts coming down at them and starts shooting. When they shoot, when they show the plane shooting, it looks like a Japanese Zero. And they run into the tree trees and Martine, I don't know if she ran into the tree or if she got to the tree, got, you know, exhausted. I think Esteban pulled her into the tree, Dana, like just because they were holding hands as they were running yeah. and she just face plants into the tree and then she just goes, you know, flat on the ground. Yeah, but it was kind of funny because he bends over her and he's like, you know, talking to her. He seemed genuinely concerned. I thought maybe she'd been shot. So back where uh, McCoy was killed, Kirk and Spock hear a plane and they look up and see a plane passing over head. And then Sulu notices that uh, McCoy's body is gone. And then Barrels points out that the knight is gone too. And Kirk and Spock were standing right next to where the knight was. Yeah, right next to it. So again, another scene where totally unrealistic. You would have heard something happening, the body being dragged off. And like you said, right next to the knight. Spock starts to say that his uh, explanation may not uh, appear to be very scientific. Then asks Kirk, what were you thinking right before you encountered the people you described? Kirk says, I was thinking of my days at the academy just then finnegan appears again and is taunting kirk and kirk says he is my problem and goes chasing after him he tells spock you and sulu go find mccoy's body i got better things to do so he goes chasing after him and they go out in the desert area again and finnegan's like appearing like a little leprechaun here and there everywhere you know it's like oh captain he 
better I am. Did you eat your lucky charms this morning? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I thought I was going to hear that line, Dana. I mean, you were so right. <laughs> it was just, I don't know if this guy was really Irish. My guess is no, because sometimes the accent seems to go in and out a little bit, but it was so stereotypical. I thought I was going to hear that line. When he does catch up to Finnegan, he's he's trying to, uh, he's like, what's going on here? And they just keep fighting. Finnegan won't tell him anything. He says, you're stupid underclassmen. I've got the edge. I'm still 20 years old. Look at you. You're an old man. Kirk knocks him down onto some rocks and Finnegan grabs his back and he says, oh, he goes, I, I hurt my back. In fact, Danny says, you broke my back. I can't feel my legs. Right when uh, Kirk goes up to him, Finnegan grabs him and flips him over. It's kind of funny because Kirk lands and we can see him from the shoulders, a little bit more than the shoulders up. And his shirt is not ripped. They go back to when he wakes up. Because he's been knocked out, right, Dana? Yeah, he's knocked out. You know, Finnegan's just kind of sitting back. And then when he wakes up, up, his shirt's ripped. I know this part so, is so obvious to me too. Sometimes, you know, these these errors are so quick you don't notice them. Who could not notice this? Just like you could definitely notice the stuntmen who are doing the fighting. Oh but, God, I'm uh, glad you brought that up, Dana, <laughs> because I thought I was being a little nitpicky. It was so obvious. So obvious. Yeah, it really was. Finnegan's still there when Kirk wakes up and Kirk really wants answers. He tries getting it out of Finnegan and Finnegan just won't say anything. So he just keeps beating the crap out of him. And then Finnegan says, it kind of makes up for things. And Kirk says, yeah, a lot of things. Kirk hits him again, then stands over Finnegan. And we see Kirk is smiling, ready to deliver a knockout punch. And then he hits Finnegan again, and Finnegan falls to the ground. Spock shows up and asks, did you enjoy that, Captain? And Kirk says, yes, I enjoyed it. After all these years, I did enjoy it. Spock says that this supports his theory that he's been formulating, and somehow our thoughts are read, and these things are provided for us. Spock says the force field is somehow manufacturing these things. We go back to where Barrows and everybody is and we see that uh, Barrows has removed the princess attire and once again is in her red uniform. Just as she is finished, Don Juan grabs her again. And it seems like these fantasies are appearing on their own now. Sulu and Rodriguez try to hold off this Don Juan just when Kirk and Spock show up. And Don Juan lets go of her and Kirk tells everybody front and center and says, don't talk, don't breathe, don't think, you're at attention. And they all stand at attention. Now, Dana, there's someone missing from this group, isn't there? Yeah. Angela Martin is not seen. So where is she? That's a good question. I noticed that right away. And they never address it. No one says, hey, hold on a second. We got to go get Angela. Just then this old dude in a robe walks up and he's got this mischievous grin on his face. Kirk asks, who are you? And the man says, I'm the caretaker of this place, Captain Kirk. We have only just discovered that you do not understand all this. These experiences were intended to amuse you. Amuse? That's your word for what we've been through? The old guy says this entire planet was made for our entire race to play. Kirk says that still doesn't explain the death of my ship's surgeon. And here's my favorite part of the show, by the way. Just then McCoy appears with two scantily clad women. McCoy says no one has died. I was taken below the surface for some remarkable repairs. Barrels looks over at the women then walks over and asks how do you explain them i was thinking about a little cabaret i know and rigel too and uh there were these two girls in a chorus line there and well here they are well after all i am on shore leave barrows kind of pushes in and takes mccoy's arm one of the women goes to sulu and the other one goes to spock and kirk's like who are you people just then kirk's communicator beeps uhura says the communications are back up The caretaker says if your people would use the proper caution, this planet would be an ideal place for your people to enjoy themselves. Kirk tells you her to start sending people down and to get them ready for the best shore leave they've ever had. Back on the ship, we see everyone coming onto the bridge, fresh from shore leave. Spock asks, Did you enjoy your rest, gentlemen? Yes, we did, Mr. Spock. I I think we did. Indeed we did, Mr. Spock. Most illogical. Now, is this the first time he uses that phrase, Dana, in any of the episodes? Because this kind of becomes somewhat of a catchphrase for him, doesn't it? Yeah. Kirk starts laughing and everybody goes back to work and Kirk keeps laughing and then says ahead warp factor one. And that's how the show ends. So this when I was watching the HBO show Westworld, 
I was pretty fascinated, especially by the first season. And it really brought up this question to me that this episode of Star Trek also brought up for me. So I'm going to pose it to you and see what your reaction is. If you had the ability in one of these amusement parks to just let loose, not have to worry about moral constraints, not have to worry about legalities, that you could shoot, kill, stab, maim, attack, and then realize that when you're done, you go back to your real life. That's maybe not who you are, maybe, but you did it at this amusement park and were allowed to, and there was no value judgment. Would you do that? Would you act in that way? I think like Westworld, if it was something where you were in a gunfight, you know, and you're defending yourself, that would be one thing. I, I wouldn't just get a gun, go down shooting robots or something. But I mean, I think that there would be some things that you'd, yeah, you'd definitely want to do. Again, the killing part would not be the uh, main attraction to me. Well, I played video games. For example, Grand Theft Auto 5. Maybe I shouldn't admit that I played that game, but, but I played that game. And it's so frustrating to me because I can't, you know, drive the car well, the controllers, I don't understand what buttons. And so after about three minutes, I just go ape and I just start shooting and killing and punching and running around until, you know, about two minutes later, the police get me. And I kind of enjoy it. I don't know what that says about me. Maybe, maybe it says a lot. I don't want my our listeners to know. But I would like to say, Dana, that if I went to one of these parks, I would be a moral person. But I also know that these are not real people. They are just, they're robots. They're, they're not real. So does it matter what I do to them? The video game is, is different because it's so obviously unrealistic. I think that any situation you're in where it would feel more lifelike, that you would still be your normal self. I think these types of parks are going to happen. I just wonder how people will react knowing that there are no ramifications for how they act. Oh, I, I think you'll see a lot of the true person come out. I would like to think that I would be a moral person, but I would also know that the, the constraints are completely off. So what would I do? I mean, I, I, I'm going to just be totally honest is that I don't know what I would do. And I think that's what Kirk is inviting to come down to that planet. People would quickly learn that there are no ramifications for what happens there. You know, without any kind of guidance, <laughs> I think it's dangerous to uh, bring the crew down and just say, you know, have the best shore leave of your life. Yeah, I agree. I don't know if you recognize, but the person that played Rodriguez was uh, a pretty well-known actor in, in a way. He was in a lot of TV shows, but he also showed up in the movie Chinatown as Lieutenant Lou Escobar. And uh, I, and it's funny because he really stood out to me in Chinatown. And then uh, when they made the sequel, I think it was like 13 years later, The Two Jakes, he was now Captain Escobar. I thought it was pretty cool. This is uh, one of the bigger roles he had in the mid 60s. Well, the other person from this episode, Yeoman Barrows, played by Emily Banks, also was quite famous. She actually got her start in 1960 when she was elected Miss Rheingold for the Rheingold beer and then started appearing in advertisements. <laughs> So Dana, let's talk about our best and worst parts of this episode. What was the best part for you? I liked the fact that McCoy was a kind of romantic interest in this show. It was uh, neat to see him in that role. It showed us a different side we, ne we don't usually get to see of him. One of my best parts was Finnegan. I thought this guy was hilarious. Uh, he was a real trickster and uh, very impish, you know, like you said, almost like a leprechaun character. And I thought he played a great foil for Kirk. How about another best part for you? It's not a ton of humor, but the, the humor that they have in this, I thought was good. Another best part for me was, this is the first time we get to see the Vasquez rocks. Again, those iconic pointy rocks that go at like a 45 angle to the sky. Uh, we see those in this episode. Also in Arena, that's with the Gorn, the alternative factor, and Friday's Child. How about a worst part for you, Dana? The caretaker saying that your civilization isn't ready for our knowledge. They didn't have a, a good description of who these people were. They hadn't thought that part out. It's the same thing again as, you know, this whole show goes on and then it's like, oh, it's just a dream. Yeah, it was a cheap way out. I agree. One of the worst parts for me when Yeoman Barrows finds those clothes, like the damsel in distress clothes, and she puts them on. She says, a lady to be protected and fought for. Once again, the sexism in Star Trek, it really pops out in several parts of this episode. Any other worst parts for you? We kind of touched on this earlier, but there's no Scotty. And again, I I think Scotty would have been perfect in this episode. One of the
the other worst parts for me, there were several continuity issues in here. We mentioned the one about Kirk's ripped shirt. First, it was not ripped. Then it was ripped. The other one that had to do with the ripped shirt was Yeoman Barrows. When her shirt was first ripped, we see the rip on the right side. When she puts her clothes back on after she changes out of the damsel in distress clothes, it's on the left side. Totally different side of the shirt is ripped. So, Dana, this episode debuted on December 29th, 1966. What else was going on in the world at the time? The uh, Monkees had the number one song with I'm a Believer. The week of December 26th through the 31st, Bonanza was the number one TV show, followed by Green Acres and the NFL Championship game, which was the Green Bay Packers beating the Dallas Cowboys 34-27. to 27. <laughs> So, Dan, let's look at the counts this week. All right, so, Dana, this this is kind of a conundrum for me, the dead crewman count. McCoy dies in this episode, clearly dead, lanced right through the heart. So, should this count as someone dying? When I watched the episode, I knew we would have this this discussion and i i thought to myself it should not count because he's not dead at the end of the show but he did die during the show i mean it's a philosophical question and maybe it's above our pay grade i don't really know you mean like what is death is i mean <laughs> yeah it seems pretty obvious but <laughs> but he was dead right during the show he was dead maybe we can compromise let's call it half can we call it a half I would, i'd be happy with a half <laughs> if we compromise we're at 20.5 i think we have to compromise all right let's compromise so, so we've got we've got half a death in this episode. We've got twenty point five for the dead crewman count. Right, let's move on. How about the shirtless Kirk rip shirt Kirk count? Well, we kind of made a big point about this. He gets thrown and his shirt is not ripped, and then he wakes up and his shirt is ripped. So I think that counts. So his shirt did get ripped. That's one for this week. We've got eight total. Okay, how about the he's dead count? Done. Yeah. So we're stuck at three. Here's another one. I think we need to talk about Dana. I'm a doctor, not a fill in the blank. What do you think? None. I can't think of a point where McCoy said that. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to disagree and push on this one a little bit, uh, Dana. He does ever say to Yeoman Barrows, dear girl, I am a doctor. When I peek, it's in the line of duty. He does say, I am a doctor. I think we should count this one. But the idea was, I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer, not a painter, not... Yeah, no, I get it. Okay, I'll uh, relent on this. So, I'm a doctor, not a fill in the blank is zero for a total of one. Dana, you've got an update for us about asteroids. Well, as uh, we had talked in last week's episode about the neutral zone and the map showing the asteroids uh, where the outposts were and the outposts were stationed on the asteroids. As I mentioned last week, the company I work for, the owner was an astrophysicist. He said, everything in space is moving. So just like the moon moves around us, asteroids are moving, the planets are moving, but to suggest that the outposts were all lined up like that, not very likely. <laughs> Dan, next week is uh, one of my other favorite episodes of the first season, Galileo 7. All right. Well, I look forward to talking about that one next week. And until then, have a great rest of your week. You too, Dan. And thanks again for doing this. As I said, every time we do it, I learn something new. All right, Dana. Have a great weekend. Live long and prosper. And happy birthday, Bob. Thanks once again for listening to Damn It Jim, the podcast. We would love to hear from you. Please send us an email at dammitjimpodcast at gmail.com or join the discussion on Facebook or Twitter. Make sure to be with us next week for the episode Galileo 7. And from Dan and Dana, enjoy the rest of your week and remember to live long and prosper.